Let's do it right now. Hit record. Yes, I it says I'm recording. I see it. Okay. And just yes. a reminder: if you're not a presenter, to please mute yourself. It's it's so oh, weird okay. that here there's more people coming in. It's just weird that my whole maybe there's something wrong with zoom tonight because my whole zoom thing is not what it usually is. And I use it all the time. It's very strange. Okay. Hey, Sans and Ray. Do we, I've what, never been what? on the. Okay. So the Daniel, are you going to go first and we'll all mute? Uh, I, th I think Mark and I will be chatting back and forth the whole okay, time. Okay, great. And uh, yeah. where is Mark? There's Mark. Okay. I see Mark. Hi, Mark. Hello. Great. I'm hey. going to mute myself. It's all yours. Uh, well, thanks for the perseverance, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, so Daniel and I, it, it's going to be pretty informal, I think, but we've been bouncing around a few ideas. And towards the end of our exchanges, Daniel came up with some very concrete um, ideas regarding art in a time of quarantine. Um, I don't think that's going to take up our whole conversation, but uh, you know, as I said, he, we were bouncing around some very informal concepts, and then he really got very concrete. And so I offered to uh, let him take the lead on those points and get them. Let me try to remember what I said now. I have uh, it right I, in front of me on Instagram. <laughs> fabulous. Uh, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just, I'll just, I have it up. So okay. But, uh, one of his points he brought up was. Uh, or is perhaps for a discussion, was the disillusion of a sense of community. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think I have to remind myself every day that my family isn't the only family going through all of this madness. Mm -hmm. um, it's a collective, obviously, trauma. Um, but, you know, it, from my point of view, um, it kind of hit home to me that art is about the individual um, and making your own work. And, you know, to paraphrase uh, Charles Bukowski, he wrote once, and this stuck with me as a young man in my 20s, uh, to, again, to paraphrase, but if you were stranded on a desert island, would you take a stick and write in the sand? And I thought about that and I, I was like, yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the art world that we new particularly in new york is not around and uh but i've still you know i've still been putting the work in and when i've been unable to get to the studio to put in the physical work i'm putting in the mental work you know i've been writing um drawing and so i think that you know i miss that community so much both my la art world friends um uh, particularly my I'm not having trouble making work, uh, which is nice because I, I get the impression that that has been difficult uh, for a lot of people. But I realized that um, my uh, input stream has narrowed to you know online sources, which is very narrow. It tends to be a self-reinforcing uh, system where uh, you know you get the same positive and negative stimuli constantly, and so your work grows narrower and narrower in response to that. And I miss uh, hanging out with my friends and chatting, and I miss uh, seeing work that I didn't anticipate uh, and don't necessarily even like, um, because I think it's uh, I think it's helpful and constructive to uh, you know to get pushed outside of uh, reference uh, region uh, on a fairly uh, regular basis. Um, yeah, you know, going to Chelsea, I miss uh, seeing shows at the museums in New York. Uh, uh, wearing a mask, extraordinarily uncomfortable, and I don't like to be photographed in it. So I'm <laughs> avoiding being uh, being in public gatherings. Um, and uh, and so, you know, my mood has been pretty good throughout the past year, but, you know, you look back and you realize that you're getting worn down in certain ways. And I think the uh, the lack of, of companionship with my art people is the way that it's been wearing me down. 
Yeah. There's a weary, yeah. a, a weariness mm-hmm. to it all. You know, one thing Diane and I always half jokingly uh, talk about is trying to find a silver lining here and mm-hmm. there. And right. They have been there for sure. Um, you know, particularly for our daughter, but um, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, we've had it really easy for quite a long time. And mm-hmm. if you look at the seriousness of purpose in the art and literature in the first half of the 20th century, they were dealing with World War One, the Depression, and World War Two. And I'm hoping that coming through this, not just the art world, but society at large, that we can jettison some of the frivolity and the irony and get rid of this postmodern poison and focus on a much more sincere art. Um, okay, then um, Then my question would, would be uh, how, oh, and I have, I have some answers to it, but I'm interested in your answers. How is this different from 9-11? Because I remember uh, after 9-11, everyone was like, oh, we can be serious again now, uh, which lasted about a year and a half. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then we were back to nonsense. Um, I think, you know, I think, and I was in New York at 9-11, you know, my right. best friend was down there as a first responder. Um, you know, I think the difference is that this, like I said, it, I called it a collective trauma, but it's the mm-hmm. entire planet. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the art world, I think postmodernism hit its apotheosis in the early to mid nineties. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, still continued to have this horrible grip, but it, at the same time, that's when the art world became much more international. Mm-hmm. You know, New York was connected to London. London was connected to my God, you know, China, Tokyo, LA, um, and I, th- I'm, my hope anyways, is that because this is so eponymous and so international in scope that it, I, I just want the wheels to churn, you know, for mm-hmm. what art is really supposed to be about, which is beauty and profundity. Um, I, I think that when you, when you phrase it that way, I think there's a better chance this time around not so much uh, because of the interconnectedness of the art world as because we have alternate distribution platforms for art now. Uh, That's an excellent but, point. Yeah, because I don't, I don't think the financial structures that, uh, that act in favor of the postmodern paradigm are going anywhere. But I do think that, uh, that we can find community and, uh, and validation outside of that structure uh, in a much more effective way uh, than was possible in 2001. So yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah. I mean, I, and you, you know, I'm, I'm from a sector of the art world that people assume dislikes every other sector of the art world. And to some extent that's true, but if you make work and you mean it, I, uh, I really am willing to, to embrace a lot of stuff that isn't what I would ever do. I just, I just want it to have like, you know, life and blood in it. Um, so yeah, I mean, I remember in the 90s, uh, I was commissioned to write a review of a Jason Rhodes retrospective at the Whitney. Mm-hmm. And I, I fully intended to write a bad review. And then by the time I did the fifth draft, I realized that I made the guy look awesome. You know, <laughs> Just <laughs> you know it's, not, it's not my stuff, but mm-hmm. there was a certain point where intellectually there was nothing negative I could really back up. And right. yeah, so I totally understand what you're saying. For yeah. sure. You know, but so, I think you and I both, and we're both writers, but I think mm-hmm. we both traffic in, well, obviously a much more traditional uh, focus in art, mm-hmm. you know, towards austerity, towards beauty, towards atmosphere, certain profundity. Yeah. And so, yeah, totally. Yeah. Um, so how's your studio practice been during this time? Ironically, as much as it's been whittled down because mm-hmm. my family and I basically fled the city in March. Where have you been? Where have you guys been? Fishkill, just south okay. of you, actually. Okay. In frozen, beautiful Hudson Valley. Wonderful. Um, we've been at my in-laws and uh-huh. when school started back up, albeit part-time, we've been going mm-hmm. back and forth. Mm-hmm. You know, we always loved coming up here, but 
once we lived here for six months, the lifestyle was so fantastic that we just really fell in love with it. But any event, I ended up, I think I went seven weeks without being in the studio. And mm -hmm. um, then since then, I've been very consistent getting in at least once a week. Mm -hmm. um, I think I've gone three times a week, a few times. Is it still in but, the city? Yes, yeah, in Brooklyn. Right. Okay. Um, but it was, it's interesting because it was so incredibly productive up to the time we left the city mm -hmm. in March that even this limited amount of time I've had in the studio, um, it's been very focused and it's been extremely productive. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like I haven't lost a lot. And again, as also being a writer, I feel like my creative output hasn't dimmed. Right. Uh, writing a lot. Uh, again, I've been drawing a lot. And, mm -hmm. you know, my time in my notebook always seems to inform my paintings, be it mm -hmm. um, from a literary angle or from a visual angle. Right. Um, it's good. You know, I, I, yeah, I can honestly say that creatively it's been good in terms of studio practice. That's great. Um, this this tangential, but I feel I feel like it's apropos. What have you been doing for martial arts while you've been uh, up in Fishkill? Well, yeah, not a lot of training partners except my daughter. Uh -huh. um, I made a real commitment to train Monday through Friday. Uh huh. Um, and I've done that consistently. That's um, great. Be it kettlebells or weights or mm -hmm. you know just shadow boxing, working on kicks. You know, I usually mm -hmm. have a goal to do a hundred kicks a day. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, sometimes Deegan joins in, like Deegan and I were doing some jujitsu today, grappling, and that Very was cool. super fun. So it's, um, it's tough though, because that's a community that uh. I, not only do I miss them, but I also know a lot of, uh, career martial artists who have just been decimated. Um, really? Yeah. I mean, my program, I went from over a hundred students to nine mm -hmm. via Zoom. So that's, Ugh. uh. Yeah, that's 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 tough. That is rough. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. I mean, we to some extent we're very lucky that uh, that there is a, a highly solitary aspect to to our creative pursuits. Um, you know, my theater friends. I you know, it's just going to be terrible for years for them. Like much much a much deeper impact than it than I think it will be for us, practically speaking. Um, you know, I uh, I couldn't get to the studio from March until September. My, I, okay, so I uh, I live in Kingston, New York, but my studio is in Brooklyn, uh, which is about 90 miles south of here. So I take a two and a half hour bus down to my studio. Uh, and the general plan since we moved up here has been uh, two days a week at the studio and five up here, uh, which was completely uh, impossible <clears throat> for much of the year. Um, so I switched basic and, you know, I don't really have a convenient painting space up here, but I didn't really feel like painting either. So I've been drawing all year. Um, and, uh, you know, I usually work with, uh, with life models when I draw uh, and I've been working from photo reference. And I found that um, it, uh, it changed what I was doing from uh, an emphasis on life and form to an emphasis on, on color and light. Uh, it was like a very much more solitary and meditative uh, way of working, and I could fiddle around forever to get really complex effects. So it uh, it opened up some formal avenues that I probably wouldn't have pursued quite as much if I hadn't been completely on my own. Mm -hmm. um, so I've been really happy with the work that I've been doing uh, with with drawing, and uh, and you know, just in the past week, I've felt like painting for the first time in a year, and I painted a painting, um, and. Uh, I was relieved to find that I hadn't gotten completely rusty. Um, and then, uh, but I've also been writing a lot. So I, I finished uh, a draft of the novel that I'm working on. Uh, I wrote some art criticism and uh, we've been homeschooling. So I've been spending a lot of time parenting and, uh, and that's a lot of fun. My little kid is heavily into electronics. So we've been, uh, we've been building uh, like, like, you know, soldering together and, uh making little synthesizers and blinky lights and things like that uh so and it's a very weird year and i was trying to explain it to somebody that like you i don't know about everyone else here but i've always had a fantasy of like getting locked in solitary confinement and wondering like how productive i would be if everything else were eliminated and it turned out that uh 
that you that and and also the part of the fantasy is that it, it doesn't suck um and uh this is exactly what this past year has been it turned out it was really productive and i had i had mostly a really good time i just miss people so why were you fading away from painting initially i don't know i um I just I did a bunch of paintings for a show uh, at the end of 2019, and I was about to start up a new process, uh, like a new type of painting uh, in 2020. And then, you know, um, but I, it was it was slow going getting a start and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. And then there was the apocalypse and it sort of seemed to just fall by the wayside. And uh, and so I, I didn't I didn't feel a need to like make myself paint. Um, and when I got back to the studio, I didn't especially feel a need to paint. Uh, I was doing a lot of drawing while I was at the studio. And, uh, and then this past, uh, past couple of weeks, I just felt like painting again. So I, I started painting. Awesome. Yeah. Another, uh, great idea that, uh, Daniel came up with when we were going back and forth was, um, to quote the dilemma of weather and how to incorporate the present into work. Oh Yeah. So that was your baby. What do you what are your thoughts there? <laughs> I mean, I, it's it's interesting because I've had this sort of I think among the many luxuries of living in a relatively ahistorical period, the way we have been for much of our lives, is that the background is fixed. So you have a sort of like a fixed context within which you're making work, and the work can uh, can exist all the dynamism can exist in the work itself. Uh, and you can assume for yourself and for your audience that the, um, that the ideas about what the world is like are, are stable. And now we're in a situation where our understanding of how things work is different from the way it was four months ago. Four months ago, it was different from the way it was four months before that. None of us can anticipate what it be like in four months. And so you hesitate to begin to incorporate present conditions into any kind of a uh, of a, a narrative or a motif in your work, simply because they'll be out of date by the time you finish the work, um, and you don't have you don't have any hindsight. Uh, you have relatively little insight. It's not even clear what's going on, and uh, and so I feel like I'm storing up impressions that might become part of work later on, and I've never felt a need to be like very Ill engaged in a linear way with the present in any of the I work in. And I, I've made films and uh, criticism, I written, I draw, I paint, and, and none of it is topical. And, uh, and I still don't feel a need to be topical, but I especially don't feel a need right now because the topic is very much in flux. But, um, you know, I also have more sympathy uh, in the present conditions for people who do feel called to respond to uh, events in the world, because obviously there are some events going on. And uh, I'm gonna come out of this with things being different from how they were when we went in. Indeed. So that, was, that seemed interesting yeah. to me. Indeed. Could yeah. we touch on your opinion of the objectivity versus subjectivity of art? Of art? Okay. Um, let me, um, cause I've got some ideas on the nature of subjectivity because um uh so i feel like there's a whole category of things which are generally long subjective but which would better be described as real existing things for which no external metric established so uh, things like revelation are in that category. Um, and uh, and there's no doubt that one has a real experience of one's uh, moods, that they have an objective existence. Nonetheless, they cannot be, you know, detected properly with instrumentation, which we can all agree on. Um, and, uh, and so for me, uh, a great deal of, uh, of art amounts to an attempt to create uh, a sort of an external formal counterpart to real internal conditions uh, so that we can communicate our experience with one another 
uh, when in as regards those experiences that are not immediately available uh, by means of their pre-existing uh, external circumstance. So that that's what I think about that. <laughs> what have you got? That's good. That's good. No, I'm just, um, I was curious to get your thoughts because I'm very much of the mind that art, and for those of you that have uh, worked with me at all like during a Kapai Pai workshop, I've made it pretty clear that I view art as a very objective thing. Patients, mm -hmm. important and what shall we say, lackadaisical work. Um, you know, I ah. used the example last year in Rensselaerville during my talk that objectively, I realized that the Beatles are great, but <laughs> I don't want to listen to them. You know, I'll stick with Miles Davis and Iron Maiden. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that uh, the objectivity has played itself out and as far as proof through the centuries, you know, you look at what stands and what holds up, um, you know, and uh, when we were having our back and forth on Instagram messaging, you know, I mentioned my Joan Mitchell moment. And I see that as a pretty good uh, testament as well, because, you know, I wrote, again, another piece of my reading uh, of her retrospective at the Whitney. And it was, while I loved her Canada series, I think it was a small series of only three to five paintings. Um, it was a pretty brutal review. It was a pretty brutal discussion of her work. But in hindsight, I noticed that I always kept going back to her work. And there was a period, the last show uh, she had posthumously at Chime Reed, um, I think Deegan was two and Diane was with us also. And I just remember watching Deegan react to the paintings. And there was this moment, this epiphanous moment where I realized that I hadn't been looking at these paintings the right way, that I was completely backward in, in the intellectual process I was taking with this. How was she you looking know, at it? She was, uh, it was the, the, the title of the show was Trees. So it was a very, very landscape based show of work from, I would say, early to mid 60s, 1960s. And Deegan's eyes were just like basketballs, you mm -hmm. know, and she, she was seriously looking at these paintings. Um, and I realized that I had been looking at her work as a young guy in my 20s that read too many books. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't experiencing them the proper way. Mm -hmm. And I actually came upon a few other artists, you know, and realized that I wasn't looking at their work properly. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think that when I'm, I'm a big fan of Clement Greenberg, uh, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and he very cogently discussed the objectivity of art. And when I began to see mistakes I had made in, you know, quote unquote taste, that's when it really dawned on me that it is objective. You know, you can be right or you can be wrong. You can like what you like, you can dislike it. But I think, and again, it goes back to what you mentioned about enjoying work that you don't particularly like somehow. Uh, me writing about Jason Rhodes. That's where you're you're trapped in this loop. You know, you can't get out of it. It's objective. It's either good or it's not. You might mm -hmm. not like it, but you might be wrong. You know, and a great mm -hmm. thing that Greenberg said, you know, he kind of comically wrote about what he called the gray area. And mm -hmm. he said that was the fun part of art. And the gray area, as he refers to it, is where, well, you know, we have um, Shana here. You know, if Shana mm -hmm. and I walk into a museum, she's, I just called her a robust intellectual this evening. But, mm -hmm. you know, if we went to a museum, <laughs> And we're standing in front of Malevich mm -hmm. and she 
is over. Yep. See, she's just all. I shouldn't have picked Malevich because I love Malevich. But anyways, the, um, the point being is that because to me the impressionists are the Beatles. Okay, let's do that. All right. <laughs> Perfect. So we go because I love the impressionists. You know. Mm -hmm. um, so we go in and we're standing in front of. Take your pick. Mm -hmm. And Shane is shitting all over it. <laughs> you know, that's the gray area. It's where two people who should be in the know have this strange digression. Mm -hmm. You know, um, another great example is, oh man, maybe 15 years ago, I went to Gagosian Gallery with the great New York painter, Pat Lipsky. Mm -hmm. And it was a Howard Hodgkins e exhibition. And I remember we didn't talk for like 15 minutes. We're just walking around. And all of a sudden, Pat said to me, these are breathtaking. And I said, Pat, these suck. <laughs> and she looked at me and she goes, you might be right, but I have to think about it. <laughs> and it was, you know, and again, it was just this awesome moment that was really so fun um, mm -hmm. that to diverge like that. You know, um, I had a thing like this. Um, that w and, you know, I think it, it, I think it has to do with with certain qualities that are that inhere in in most art that will become uh, helpful to people mm -hmm. if they hit them at the right time. I had this friend who just didn't get art, and I dragged him to a museum, and I was like, "God damn it, we're just going to keep looking at stuff until you get it." And then I, you know, I was wandering around, and I lost track of him, and I, uh, and then I, 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 I went to look for him, and to my horror he had become entranced with Renoir and, <laughs> and, you know, he had his first aesthetic experience of a painting looking at a Renoir. And I was like, this is, this is a nightmare for me because I hate Renoir. I think he's insipid. Um, and, uh, and here he, he, he's speaking to your soul. And, and he was like, I don't, I don't know. I just get painting now. And, and it was, it was terrible, but, uh, you know, if, if it's in Renoir, it's in almost everything. So. <laughs> well, I've, I've mentioned to several friends that um, my mom mm -hmm. has this, like she was completely never exposed to art as a child or huh. even an adult. And right. she's got this amazing natural eye. Like she'll come out to my studio in Encino, which God, I haven't been to in almost a year, but anyways, I digress. Oh. Um, and she'll walk in and she'll mention some negative element of a passage in a painting and mm -hmm. they'll leave. And then I'll look and I'll be like, God damn it. She's right. <laughs> um, and Diane too, Diane, you know, I don't think had a lot of exposure to art growing up, mm -hmm. but she's got this amazing, very organic eye. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I actually, I think that that's more proof to um, the objectivity of art. You know, when you see somebody that doesn't have the, the background um, to really appreciate paintings in the right way, um, mm -hmm. I, think it's, I think it's really important. I, I, and it's awesome to see, you know, I love, you know, I love sharing art with Diane just cause it's so cool to see what she's gonna come up with, mm -hmm. um, yeah. It, you remind me of uh, a bunch of uh, people from my dad's generation whose introduction to classical music was these sort of like, um, you know, compilation records that you could get uh, like at the grocery store or something that, you know, were not especially well chosen or well performed, but it, it, it opened up that entire world to them because uh, it was there. And, and because, you know, no matter, no matter, no matter what element of that uh, universe you looked at, uh, once you were ready to enter that universe, it held the potential to reveal all of it to you. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think that there, I think there's certain art. You know, when, if, when you when you describe the experience of art that way, there's some art that like, oh, there's almost all art that ha that has like certain formal qualities. That if you're putting art at the basic level, then yes, it's amazing, even if the work is terrible. Um, and then there's art that uh, like if it hits you at the right time in your life, it's profoundly moving uh, and you can miss that, that opportunity or you might be the wrong person for it. Uh, and then there's like, there's certain pieces that will make you in person for the work. 
uh, like Las Meninas will change you uh, in in many cases. Like it will make you ready for Las Meninas uh, when you find yourself in front of it because it's that powerful a piece of work. Um, so the, you know, there's a, there's a whole cosmos of, of opportunities and 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 options uh, that art uh, that art presents. Uh, you know, in in ter in, ter in terms of that, um, that, that, I think that, I think that that is a proper subjective experience that you're describing, uh, even though the art itself um, does does contain objective uh, properties and values that, um, you know, that's why we have criticism. <laughs> Indeed, actually, so that we, at that point, I remember uh, Deegan and I were at the Tate Modern uh, last year, last February, actually. And um, we were sitting in the Rothko room. Mm -hmm. And this couple came in who, you know, to be critical of them, I would say they clearly didn't know anything about art. They were jabbering away. I think one of them was scrolling. And I was immediately pretty pissed off. Mm -hmm. The cool thing was is the instant they fully got into the room, they fell completely silent. Ooh. And that to me, to my face, because that was mm -hmm. this moment where, you know, I hate to use the word Philistines, but, you know, these Philistines <laughs> fell under the trance of mm -hmm. great art. You know, it was actually a very cool, cool little moment. That's great. Yeah. Oh, there's a comment. Was that coming from you? No, no, I'm seeing a lot of them, but I haven't been able. I, I can't read and Can listen I at the same answer, time. So this is sort of a question, Dan. You mind if I answer it? Okay. Sure, so, sure. Uh, Mark, you said appreciate paintings in the right way. Was that coming from your objective or subjective point of view? So I would say that appreciating a painting in the right way is. I'm going to go out on a limb and call it objective my statement was subjective because that's me making it, mm -hmm. um, you know, but I think, you know, again, the, the idea, and well, I'll go back to Joan Mitchell. Um, I wasn't looking at her paintings in the right way. You know, my, maybe it's because my eye wasn't mature. Maybe it's because I hadn't seen enough precedence to what she was trying to do. Um, things that that could answer it but you know I just you know I'm 54 now so when I look back on myself at the age of 27 writing about Joan Mitchell I I don't see that as mature work you know I, I just think I was I was missing the boat you know but Diane just wrote down a question what is the right way you know um it's tough. I mean, can you touch on that, Dan? What's the right way to look at a painting? Oh boy. Um, okay. So I think you develop uh, an arsenal of techniques, uh, right? So there's a purely formal level at which you um, you look at a painting uh, in terms of the elements of design. You know, color, and shape, uh, texture. Uh, you know, the, the arrangement of the elements uh, in an overall composition. Um, and within that very, very basic framework, it is possible to distinguish a uh, composition which has pleasing qualities because of uh, certain uh, near symmetries or uh, exciting juxtapositions or, um, uh, you know, any, anything else that you, you can do to versus bad. And I think that I think that we can all recognize when a composition is bad at the very least because it's mm. boring. Uh, we might disagree about why a composition is bad if it's interesting. But if the composition is boring, then we would all say this is boring. And uh, once we get beyond a very um, like infant level of visual processing, we all kind of agree on what constitutes boring. Uh, we might not agree on what constitutes good. Uh, but interesting is obviously better than boring. Um, so this very basic uh, formal level at which we can uh, appreciate art. Um, and then beyond that, uh, what you have to do 
is you have to make your peace with the legitimacy of the idiom. Um, so for me, for a long time, I was not willing to credit abstract expressionism with legitimacy. I still have a great deal of trouble um, with pop art as a legitimate uh, mode of artistic expression. Uh, Postmodernism, I find uh, objectionable, but I'm if, that I'm unwilling to categorically reject things at this point. So once you fail to categorically reject something, you begin to investigate the um, the properties within that idiom that yield work that is beautiful and meaningful. And those rules are not the same from idiom to idiom. And certain work will create its own sui generis uh, category, but most work falls in a large, you begin to learn what the properties of that category are. So I'm a figurative art. Expressiveness of, of the face is a huge big deal in figurative art uh, of the highly rendered sort that I favor. And so we learn uh, stronger facial reading and we learn to appreciate the deftness and the inventiveness and the subtlety and the uh, sensitivity of portraiture. And that's to a person who doesn't look at it, it's like a person who doesn't listen to rock music who says it all looks the same. Um, but once you start to really learn about it, there's a world of difference, you know, between Rembrandt and Van Dyke. These are two, two people with two profoundly different uh, outlooks, and those result from profoundly different understandings of human nature and emotional and psychological emphases. Uh, and it doesn't make one better or one worse, but uh, it does. You, when you begin to appreciate those differences, you begin to be able to elucidate the objective properties of work that are not immediately obvious. And this applies to the properties of work uh, all across um, all across all across the visual spectrum. So the impressionists, uh, under their own rules, are very interested in the fidelity of their depiction of color, not necessarily to real color, but to the psychological experience of color. And you can compare and, uh, and rate the Impressionists in terms of their uh, success and failure at evoking a vivid sense of mood. And for me, this bleeds out of Impressionism itself. And you can see it across uh, late 19th century painting and, uh, and even in a great deal of um, the much more finicky uh, uh, 20, late 20th century and co contemporary painting, the doctrine of the psychological quality of color in scenes that are recognizable is something that art has inherited from the Impressionists. And I think the Impressionists had relatively few reference for it, apart from maybe Vermeer. Uh, you know, this idea that you could capture the real, something that resembles deep spiritual meaning within the very narrow confines of a nearly scientific evaluation of color uh, is now a thread in art history. And, uh, and once you begin looking for it, you see it. And once you see it, you have uh, a metric by which to judge work that wants to be judged that way. Not all work wants to be judged that way. Lots of work is either not colorful, does refer to a real scene. It's very explicitly, that's also legitimate. It is so complex and so multivariate that it comes to re resemble subjectivity because it's almost irresolvable. But and say this particular tiny facet of the tremendous world of art is important enough for me to want to sit down and chase that all the way to its logical conclusion. And then you have a deep reading of a single work or of a movement or of a quality that inheres in a number of works. And then they make available to you a tool for looking at art uh, that you might never have stumbled on on your own. So for me, it's possible to 
externalize and formalize the objective qualities of art. That's uh, that's what I would mean by it. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we got another. So, uh, look at inside the right way to look at painting: academic, emotional, subjective. I think all three of those are relevant, academic, emotional, subjective. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you bring your subjective views to art, but, you know, as I was saying, in the end, you're either right or you're wrong. You know, <laughs> art is either good or it's bad. Uh -huh. And the art of art where, you know, Shana and I can go into a museum and disagree vehemently over name your impressionist yeah. of the month. Um, one of those would be great. <laughs> I bow to your altar, so yeah. um, but you know, it's also, I think, and I think I learned this looking at abstract painting that very formal, abstract, you know, strong New York abstract painting that didn't jive with me aesthetically and. I, I think I honed the tools to look at formally and to process what was going on in the painting. And, you know, again, I think that that's, that points to the objectivity of art is that, um, well, again, you know, Daniel was alluding to it of, you know, enjoying the art that he doesn't really like. Um, there's a lot of very rigorous painting in New York that, I can't really relate to, but after, you know, 20 some odd years of working at it, I can appreciate it. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think that's what I meant by the right way. Um, you know, looking at art can be a very, it, you know, obviously it's a very exhilarating experience, but it can also you know, there's going to be times where you have to earn the exhilarance. You know, you have to put that time. In. You have to think about it. You have to work through it. Um, you know, the first time I heard Ornette Coleman wasn't an ecstatic moment in my life. You know, um, I heard dissonance and I didn't enjoy it. But I put a little bit of time in and there was a payoff. And I think that's what I mean by, you know, the right way to look at art. So you want to open up questions, Dan? Sure. Yeah. I'd love to hear from people. Yeah, let's do it. I was say All one right. more thing than let everybody else, but because of what you said, Mark, about Joan Mitchell and, and, and about um, that continuum. I often try to practice in criticism, um, it, this Buddhist concept of like examining your resistance. So when I come up against something that I absolutely like can't handle it, like that, that's so crazy, what the, I, I make a point of like stopping for a minute and asking myself why I feel so strongly. And it's just what you said about interesting versus boring being maybe a better question than good versus, you know, and so, uh, you know, that's, that's another, an, another dimension that kind of, you can trick yourself into transcending your own taste, mm -hmm. spend some more time with it just to make sure. And then at the end, mm -hmm. I often find myself saying, oh, I get it. I see what the artist's intention was. They definitely got there maybe it still isn't a place I want to go, but, you know, well done. I'm glad I stayed here for a little while longer to get to the end of that riddle. Um, and I, to my mind, that's a kind of I mean, right way. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a fantastic uh, approach. Like I think of it as like the leap of faith or um, uh, negative capability, but tricking yourself is the same exact thing. Yeah. I, I mean, the first, critical piece I wrote um, for Performing Arts Journal was Damien Hurst's show at Matthew Mark's Soho space. This is in, God, 94 maybe. 
and it was the cross-sectioned cow in several vitrines. Mm -hmm. And then there was a, a bisected pig in two vitrines work. And I remember walking in there and I was brutally hung over. And <laughs> yeah, I, I couldn't wrap my head around it. And, um, but that's what I did. I gave myself over to it. I stayed in that gallery for like two hours. Um, and, you know, I don't know if what I wrote, I don't think what I wrote was incredibly positive, but it, there was a weird lack of negativity to it. But I had, as abhorrent as I found it, I kind of gave myself over to the experience. Um, but yeah, I, yeah. Shana, you're yeah, spot on. Yeah. Sean Baxter's got a question in chat. Uh, in creating work, how do you get your critical brain to play nice with your creative process? Oof. You want to take that first? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, uh, I do all that beforehand. Um, and if my critical brain is going to swamp me, uh, the work just doesn't begin. Um, and then I think of, uh, of the critical... Like there are two forms of critical brain. There's like analytic critical, which is verbal. And then there's visual uh, or intuitive uh, critical, which is uh, of one body with the work. Um, and I distract the verbal uh, side of my brain, uh, either by thinking about something else or listening to a podcast. And then I need the critical part of the, ver the visual uh, critical part of my brain to make the work good. Uh, I obviously I have like a uh, an emotional explosion approach to, to work like I, I kind of know what I'm trying to do and there's like intention and discovery but it's in the context of um of a plan uh so that's how it works for me how does it work for you Mark I think because as an abstract artist um mm -hmm. I'm not working within the parallels that a more figurative artist would be so for right. me um, I'm, I'm free, you know, it's, it's, uh, if painting isn't working, I'm free to lay it or something on it and then <laughs> wipe it up or put it back on the wall and hit it with a spray bottle and just see where that takes me. So for me, that isn't, um, that much of an issue. Uh, and also my work is very process oriented. So, um, you know, the, the critical brain comes into effect as the painting nears conclusion. I think that's fair mm. to say. You know, my paintings start off very violently and they become more quiet as they go along. Um, mm -hmm. And also my paintings take a couple years to make. So oh, hold on. You know, I got a lot of room. <laughs> oh, my wife has some. Sometimes you come home and you're like, oh my God, I made a mistake. That's your critical by circumscribing what you're doing within those very strict rules, uh, you, you achieve a great deal of liberty and uh, in, be in staying awake to the subtleties of the, of the events inside of that arena that you've given yourself. Uh, and so you, it would be extraordinarily important for you to both uh, have committed sense of consciousness, but also a very um, involved critical apparatus uh, so that you can make things that are living uh, and then call bullshit on yourself uh, uh, if it's if it's as art. Because I also see your work as, like, as being formally that it's not enough to have a, a real experience in making it. It's got to be in the work in the end. Um, so that's my guess about how things go with it. No, you. I mean, that, that's that's totally spot on totally spot on uh, um i mean the other night wednesday night i was in the studio and um i was working on one painting in particular that 
was just rapidly going south, so to speak. And um, it was stressful to a certain extent, but by the, you know, as I said, I've got a lot of freedom. So I know that at a certain point, I'm going to turn it around. And again, this might be a painting that I work on for three or four years, but you know, there's been a lot of those paintings. Um, but I have to, it has to work, like you, you said the word arena, you know, which I love, you know, it has to work within my arena. You know, I'm not mm -hmm. going to throw something out there. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, sometimes they're harder than others. Yeah. Mark, <laughs> yeah. Sure. Mark, can I, Mark, can you hear me? Yes, Catherine. Mark? Yes, my dear. Um, when you say you have a lot of freedom, what exactly do you mean? Well, I think, I mean, you know, if I can drag Daniel into this, mm -hmm. I've always felt that a figurative artist has their vehicle and it's, you know, and obviously there, it's very, there's a craft to it. And then you inject the art into it. And that's what makes it important. You know, that's why I think Daniel's work is so important is that there's an atmosphere to it. Uh, the volume is very different. You know, there's a lot of very powerful points to his work but it's in a very strict paradigm as an abstract painter you know god i mean if a if paint splatters on painting while i'm working on another painting i can paint it out i can incorporate it it's just there's a uh and also it is that um, there's a lot of trial and error. So when I show up to the studio, there's no warm up. I get to work. And if something is not working, I paint it out and I go back in. And I think that's, that's a freedom that some artists do not have. Um, my friend, great artist, James Austin Murray works in oil and works with very large organic gestures. Now, he has the freedom, particularly since it's oil, you know, if this gesture doesn't work, he'll make another gesture. But by the same token, there is a deliberate to his making of a painting that I don't have to adhere to. Uh, and from a technical standpoint, one is because I use acrylics. Um, so if something doesn't work, I'm painting over it. Um, so I think that's so so the question then would be Daniel do you um, regard that you have a, a, a different kind of freedom because yours you're dealing with the figure and maybe there's a more restrictive history it's uh it's interesting I I think that uh we find uh the, our um, our loci of freedom in different locations. Uh, like there's the there there are you know I have uh, a universe of 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 motions of the body and its mean and the meaning of those motions of the body and the means of expressing those motions that uh, that is my main expressive language. Um, Mark's expressive language comes in the uh, the formal properties that evolve from the physicality of the paint, uh, and so he has he has a language with a very very large number uh, or an alphabet with a large number of letters in it. I have a different alphabet, and it's not necessarily even possible to count the letters the same way, um, and also. And I, you know, I'd actually be a little bit, more, a little bit interested in, uh, in, in your experience of this. I think of my work as, as being at its best when I have no experience of liberty in it at all. When I feel that I am entirely taken over by the nature of the thing and merely uh, 
am acting to serve it. And there's invention within that action, but its fundamental path is is determined outside of my will. Um, and then I know that I'm that I'm that I'm working correctly. Um, yeah. 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 I um, you know, so my paintings, I call it the blue collar period. Mm -hmm. uh, when I start a painting, it can take anywhere from a couple of months to a year or two. And it's essentially not, it's not what I call art. It's blue collar work. You know, it's working on plumbing or putting up a wall, you know, I'm taping off lines, I'm freehanding lines, I'm figuring out composition. And then at a certain point, the painting takes over. And that's when the art is happening. Uh, I think that's a quality that, you know, Daniel was alluding to there. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's a, it's a process oriented practice. It's, you know, going in, getting started work, the work that needs to be done. And then, you know, there's the beauty of discovering something that is art in what you have done. That's really marvelous. Thank you, sir. Uh, Lori has a good question here. Yeah. Uh, how does the creative process ping pong between the spheres of verbal and visual, Dan? Uh, my, I'm I'm much less intellectual about my work than uh, than listening to me talk or write about it would suggest. Uh, it's almost completely uh, nonverbal and intuitive. Um, I mean, I can, I can analyze the hell out of it afterwards, but I don't really trust my analysis of my own work because I don't think I understand my work. Um, I, I put a lot of work into understanding other people's work, but I'm not very interested in understanding my work. Um, and uh, I just like making it. If I didn't like making it, I wouldn't do it. Yeah, yeah I think for me, it's... Um... it's... My literary interests, my interests in history, they inform my paintings in a way that is difficult for me to express outside of the paintings. Um, I think a lot of you know that I'm invested in keeping notebooks and the notebooks will have drawings, the notebooks will have poems, lists, uh, quotations. And, um, and, you know, in the end, those interests find themselves in my work. Um, you know, I have, I did a painting in 2018 called He Then Traveled to Rhodes to Study Rhetoric. And, and it was all about this uh, story in Julius Caesar's youth where he was kidnapped by pirates. And at night he would tell them trying to sleep and they would. During the day he would recite poetry and they would make fun of it. And he would tell them, well, that's all right. You make fun of my poetry. When I escape, I'm gonna come back and kill you all. And, you know, it was this, this amazing, you know, I think he was like 20. And he had this force of personality that he could do this. And he did do it. He escaped. And then he tracked them down and he killed them all. Um, but because he made friends with them first, he cut their throats before he hung them. You know, I mean, and I was carrying around that story in my head. And there was this one painting in my studio that just became, he then traveled to Rhodes to study rhetoric and philosophy. You know, there was this casual, yeah, he killed 50 pirates and then he traveled to Rhodes to study rhetoric and philosophy, as you do. Um, so, um, yeah, so I have a very personal connection between the two and I can't always, I totally understand if nobody else on the planet sees it, um, but to me, uh, there are particular paintings where, you know, what I'm reading or what I'm writing 
they've really come together in a very, very personal way, very intimate way. Yeah. Yeah. I've had that experience, experience sometimes where uh, anything is embedded in it. Uh, it was something that was very urgent for me somewhere else at the time, uh, which no one else will ever get. Uh, even if I told them, the connection would not be obvious. Yeah. But it's important for me. And I think it informs the, uh, the vehemence of the work. Yeah. So, yeah. For sure. But, but do you guys feel um, a certain frustration that all of this intensity and, you know, intelligence and research and emotion that goes in behind these works don't communicate what you're, you know, experiencing and you're bringing to it. I mean, I would want to know all those things. Um, I, I think they're important. I would want to know all those things I looking think that at your work. For me, um, I don't find that frustrating. You know, I would love to sit down with a person that just bought a piece and say, let me tell you about the genesis of this. Um, but it's very satisfying to me as an artist, knowing the depth of content that goes into a painting. Um, you know, and again, uh, I, I would love to have the conversation with anybody viewing my painting. You put that story in your catalog, it. Mark. I mean, it's not like it's a secret. Like, yes. right, like that's in the, the book. Well, um, the book got a little derailed well, because of quarantine. It's that's still in progress. Book, but it's in there. But I'm just saying like that, if that's a story that, um, you know, short of literally writing it on the painting, <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. it's, it, it's not like, don't tell that story. Like we codified that story, yes. that teaser reference. We explored actually um it was multiple images the genesis and the significance of the title because with a non-figurative piece you if the title is the place you yes. have to put a story and you do that and we make a whole so i hope everyone does get a chance to read that but just to say like you know some of that stuff um it's in the energy of the piece and I need mean, very much what animates the, the work. Um, so it's not a, a huge distance to just, you know, to kind of find the references. I, I feel that. I appreciate abstract and get literary with their titles as a general matter for that exact reason. So it's, it's, it's a whole process where you see the work and then you have to bring um, supplemental or um, efforts in information into understanding what's, yeah, 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 what's yeah. there. You know, uh, I mean, another painting that's very important to me um, was I called the 10,000. And, you know, again, it was me delving into my interest interest in history and it was the story of the uh, Greek general Xenophon who had an army of 10,000 mercenaries who were trying to overthrow the Persian emperor and when that revolution fell through he had to get his men home and along the way they encountered the ruins of the Assyrian empire and, you know, the story has that the walls were over 100 feet tall, over 50 feet wide. And it was a technology that, and Xenophon was an architect as well. It was a technology that he couldn't figure out. And he found out from the locals that it had been there forever. You know, so this is an, a far more ancient civilization than his. And yet they had a far greater technology. And 
so that's another thing that I had in my head. And so I'm working on this painting and it's, it's essentially a white painting. It's from my white series. Um, and the complexity just kept building up and, you know, it just became obvious to me that this painting was the 10,000. So, you know, again, it's just, I, you know, I have so many examples of, of these elements coming into play. You know, but, and it means a lot, you know, it's important to me. It, it reminds me of the story about the person who walks into a classroom and there's this huge math problem written on the chalkboard, old school chalkboard. And I'm paralleling this to your work. They look at all these marks and, and you know, abstract forms and say, well, I don't know what's going on here, but I know it's important. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, my dear. So Daniel, yeah. are, you, are you, do you feel that your work conveys everything up front? Oh. Or is it, is it more, I have to go back to the desk and get the adjunct information to catch up? No, I mean, I don't really, I don't, the, I'm not making the work so that that particular process can be uh, either explicitly encoded in it or uh, <laughs> to, to ask the person to, uh, to find out uh, that that's what was on my mind. Um, I, uh, the, a, a friend of mine came up with a great phrase many years ago, uh, the ghosts of information. It was in a conversation we were having, I forget who came up with it, um, but we were talking about, uh, about uh, a painting where you can see the traces of other layers uh, and and th things that aren't that that you can't really decode anymore, but they're still latent in it, and they inform the the image that you can see, uh, and we called it the ghosts of information. And more and more things that, uh, in my understanding of art have like fallen into the category of the ghosts of information. It's not important for you to be able to decipher all of this. What's important is that it makes a difference in in the given artwork, uh, and so. Uh, like a process the, for me, like the, the first element of this, uh, and it's a formal element, and I, I, I chase after it, especially in painting, is the complexification of the surface. Like I don't want a smooth surface. Uh, you know, I paint flesh, and, uh, and it's possible to paint flesh to a glassy smoothness, but it doesn't feel like flesh at that point. It, uh, you know, it feels like a perfect gradient, which has no life to it. So you have to complexify it and introduce irregularities and inconsistencies. And if you can, if you can learn to do that properly, you start to get the feeling of the discontinuities of flesh and it begins to take on life. But in a, in a, in a deeper sense, your painting will have uh, the traces of the errors that you made. Uh, and Matisse was great at this. Uh, he, was, he was great at preserving fossils of earlier incarnations of the painting in the final painting. And it's part of why looking at his surfaces is so rewarding. Uh, but then there's also the, uh, the psychological or narrative ghosts of information, which I think is what, uh, is what Mark is describing, where you went through some intense personal process, but that's not what the work is about. It does inform the work and the work bears the scars uh, and, uh, and irregularities of having emerged from such a process, but it's not necessary that the viewer should, should know that process. Once the information has been worn away and there, there are no catalogs left and there's just the painting, the painting is richer because it meant something to the artist. And it's not, it's not that it's like the, in any sentimental way, it, it is a, uh, it ha the, the painting has more to offer the viewer, even though its origin uh, is mysterious. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not out to make work that encodes uh, the, you know, the process of its making in, in that literal way. Uh, and if it's interesting enough, I'll make something about that. Um, so, you know, there's, there's my take on it. 
it's interesting because I see your work, Daniel, as um, light and dark. Mm -hmm. I see it as light falling on the figure. And I, I think I have tried to indicate that in a few responses to your work. But anyways, it's the light on the figure more than it's the figure. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm I mean, thrilled that you feel that way because that's very much how I'm approaching it. Oh, really? So th just that the figure makes the light visible, you know? Mm. Yeah, or, and vice versa. Mm -hmm. It's the vehicle for the light. Yeah. It, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's that yummy light and what it does and doesn't do and and um it, it's compelling and of course the figure we all can relate to the figure because we're all figures of some sort maybe not as beautiful as the figures you're drawing but you know we do have arms and legs and torsos well, thank you yeah yeah all right yeah. Anybody have anything? All right. Wow. Dan, parting thought. Up, oh, son. Oh, you yeah. got. No, I was. I was gonna say any parting thoughts. That was just. Yeah, Dan, terrific. parting thought. An over. Ah, it's hour. man. I really. I will look forward to doing this in person. This is great, but it would be much better to do this over drinks in person. And I. <laughs> Yay! Yay! Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it would. Yes, it would. I just so. thought it would be nice to thank all the, or to welcome all the new Key Pai Pai fellows who just went through last weekend's Key Pai Pai. So welcome. 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 And uh, Mark, thanks for proposing this. It is really great chatting with you, and it's, it's great to see everybody. Yeah, I thought I thought it would be a good conversation. Yeah. Yeah, I was stoked <laughs> about it. Well, thank you. I'm I really think as touched. different as our work is, there's uh, some very strong characteristics that we share. Thank you. you likewise. Thank you both of you guys. Thank you, All right. you guys. All right. Everyone, for Have a great out. evening. Aunt, thanks for the emergency. Lori, thanks for helping. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Positive. You know, this is our community now. So. I just want you all to know that I have been in touch with Andy. And she said that she's really sorry. She was stuck in the rental car place without her phone. <laughs> and she had just gotten home at almost about eight o'clock. Yeah, and that sounds shady to me. I don't know. He's <laughs> yeah. yeah. like, I ain't buying it. He's right. hanging out in some um, car with some guy. <laughs> Yeah, that's what we know in Vegas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. in Vegas. <laughs> you know, I hope you'll, nope, join, you us. I hope you'll join us next Friday because I'm going to be the speaker. Andy's yeah. asked me to speak um, about the evolution of my art ideas and practice and career um, because it's become this very integrated practice of being an artist and an uh, environmental activist but also curator, writer, educator, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm gonna be talking about that and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody and having a discussion, so. Thanks, Don. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Thanks, you guys. Superwoman. Have, night. Come in later. have a great night. Daniel, thank you so Bye. much. Bye, Diane. Great to see everybody. Bye. 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 Down here, leave meeting down here.